One of the topics that comes up a lot for me is around company culture. People get really committed to saying this is who we want to be rather than this is honestly how it is here. And I think yeah. that's maybe the biggest mistake. If I was dating, I wouldn't say like, this is the guy I want to be. I've had such a long career in learning and development. I've literally worn every uniform that you can wear within like my field. Leadership training is is quite a hot topic at the moment, isn't it? Big time. Somebody in a key leadership role will say, hey, we just need leadership training for our managers. And I'll be like, hey, great, but can I dive a little bit deeper? And I feed them all of this information and I test their reaction to it. And often that can be a really big reaction because the people in their business don't see it the same way that they see it. There's a lot of pressure in talent acquisition to get someone in quickly, to keep in mind DEI initiatives and culture. And sure. I don't think many people want to talk about it, no. but it's a huge challenge within our industry. I mean, I feel your pain. I wouldn't yeah. actually thrive doing what you do. We just want somebody that's going to be a, a nice face on a poster, but because we recognize that that's a deficit for us for the next stage of the journey. Or is it that you actually believe that and you're willing to stand by that and help people to take a step that maybe they were finding hard to take. I think often people find themselves in manager positions. They were potentially like a really strong individual contributor. And then that success kind of like propelled them to a position where let's just stick more people around this good person. And then hopefully that person's like experience will rub off on these other people. That's not taking into account any of the skills that that person would now need to have as a people manager. And there's also this stereotype that if you're in a leadership position, whether you're new to it or 10 years in, that you're an expert in it and you shouldn't ask for help. Right. And you shouldn't feel like that. It just makes me feel like I'm weaker, even though it might not be true. Yeah. But I think that's what people are afraid of. Agreed. There's more going on in your head mm. than in reality. And when I started having remote one-to-ones, for the people that things had been really good with in close proximity, that was the challenge that you described. Mm. They felt further away. But some of the people that I had struggled with, meaningful conversations, I was getting many more skins deeper on the onion and able to help that person way more. And it happened with, I think, five people. So it just goes to show that we think that there's like a best solution mm. for every situation, but I really think it does come down to the individual. Yeah, because it's not, as managers, it's not about us. Totally. At the end of the day, it's about the, yeah. the workforce around us. I've had to learn that lesson more than once, yeah. I would say. Oh, culture is not just about and we hear all the time, like, it's a flat hierarchy. Everyone's talking around the water cooler. Anyone can make a suggestion. Most of the time, that's bullshit. Chris, welcome to Talent Exchange Podcast. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So before we talk about what you're up to at the moment, I find your story about your upbringing incredibly interesting. <laughs> so it would be good to just dive into how you became a learning and development specialist. Okay, yeah, then uh, I'll take it right back to the beginning, uh, to my childhood. I'll try not to be uh, too on the doctor's couch here. But yeah, I think when I was a kid, I was raised by, uh, by two teachers for parents. So yeah, that was a really nice upbringing in many ways. It meant that I was really involved in some of the things that my parents were working on. I really knew their job. And um, I can remember being a kid and sitting with my dad and he was planning out lessons for the following day. So how are we going to make this engaging or this is the topic that we need to cover. And often that would be for kids like much older than myself. And I was really in it, you know, interested, helping him, typing up notes, cutting things out, all of that stuff, sometimes marking homework. And I think for the most part, that was like really, really fun and a great connection with my parents. But that kind of had a bit of a dark side as well, because then I became this really annoying kid at school. Oh. Um, I look back and I'm so glad that I didn't have to be a teacher for a kid like me, you know, because I could always just see what was going on in the lesson plan. I could see when a teacher was not prepared. I knew when the content wasn't right. I could see when they weren't really switched on or trying to um, trying to engage kids. And I would say it. So I was quite challenging. I mean, a real piece of work, honestly. So I would be saying, that's just not correct. Or why have you done it that way when we haven't even covered this? And of course, that's like not what teachers are used to or yeah. what they should really expect from a kid. So my report card was always like, um, <clears throat> he's got good energy, but he could use it in a different way, this yeah. kind of thing. Um, like if he just applied himself in a different way, he could be a real force for good. And I think a lot of that came also from, I had this 
some kind of chip on my shoulder. I don't know where it came from, but I really wanted to be a grown up already from when I was a young child. Mm. And I thought of myself as an adult. I don't know if that's a bit weird, but that meant that if teachers or adults talk down to me or rude, that was like a real trigger for me. Mm. There was a teacher that said to me one day, like addressing me by just my surname, you know, hey, Shamroth. And I was like, green? And he sent me out of the room for being rude. Mm. And I left thinking, this just isn't fair, you know? So why are you not treating me the same way that you want to be treated? So I think that that was a really, I made it a bit tough for myself growing up. And, and I knew for sure that, yeah, whatever I did with my life, I 100% would not be a teacher. So it triggered you as well that your parents were teachers and you did not want to pursue this career exactly path. it pushed me about as far away as you could from wanting to to help people learn so yeah and then i just was kind of like a young person out in like trying to start a career i didn't know what i was doing i was trying what mm. did you study for like your a level i was studying or... things like communication and theater things like this oh nice i kind of had it in my mind that i would be on a stage somewhere acting or performing um, oh, and here you are today <laughs> in <laughs> no, front I'm of here cameras with a microphone. <laughs> um, but yeah, that that really wasn't it for me. And I I did really enjoy just hard work. So mm. I was I moved out really young. I wanted to be like the man of my own home or something. I really wanted to move through the gears of life. Like mm. I wanted to find a girlfriend, like have children, have a house. I really wanted all of that like grown up stuff. So I was working like two or three jobs. Like it could be anything from like cleaning to bar work to office work. And eventually when I was working in like an office setup, then I thought I really get this environment. Like I get what the business is trying to do. I know what my manager expects or needs of me. And I was immediately finding myself doing my work really well, but like helping other people. Mm. And then I kind of got a bit spotted for that. And I got thrust into a kind of like SME position. Right. where people it was my job for people to come to me for advice and for guidance and then there was a small jump and then before you knew it I was on like a kind of front of a training room delivering training to people and I was loving it you know yeah. I was like um I kind of had it in my mind that I was a kind of tv host or something mm. you know so it was like high entertainment high energy funny engaging getting people doing weird things anything to help people to enjoy learning basically yeah and it was giving me such a buzz to see people like getting it you know mm. learning the skills or the knowledge they needed to go and be better at their job and then i remember just thinking i've just become a teacher <laughs> the very thing i did not want to be and it's oh, happened so yeah that's a, that's a bit my uh, my story but be, being a trainer and being a teacher is it's very different like you said being mm. a trainer you're normally outsourced you're you're paid to do that um within sorry you're paid to do that at a company and you are expected to be entertaining memorable mm -hmm. whilst a teacher just shows up right and normally they read off powerpoint slides or whiteboard yeah i think there's different ways to do both jobs and i think that there are a lot of crossover opportunity probably both trades could learn something from uh, from each other if i'm mm. honest but um I think like adult learning, whether you call that training, teaching, coaching, whatever, that's just about meeting people where they are and where they like meeting them where they need the help. So mm. I think maybe teaching is more prescriptive, like everybody needs to be shipped, like sheep dipped through this content. Yeah. And everybody needs to learn the same stuff. Mm. And we're not taking into consideration whether you already know it or whether you're ever going to use it or whether you're interested in it. Just everybody goes through. Whereas I think adult learning, because it's, you're always taking somebody out of their job yes, to go and learn something. So it costs you twice. Mm. You have to pay for somebody to, to do the training and you take that person away from being productive. So I think it's a bit more purposeful and there's more of a trend away from, hey, let's just put everybody through this uh, essential course yeah. and say like, what do people really need to do a better job and perform? perform well you know? yeah yeah i i totally agree normally mm. i'm just thinking about the learning and development environments i've been surrounded by um in 
current company and previous companies, you normally volunteer unless it's like a cybersecurity training, mm -hmm. which is mandatory. You normally volunteer for time management training, project management training, mm -hmm. etc., or management training. I think leadership training is is quite a hot topic at the moment, isn't it? Big time. Yeah. I th for me, it's like a huge gap in the market as well. So now that I'm looking more through like my entrepreneurial lens, let's say, I'm really seeing like huge opportunities, especially in like startups, scale ups, younger companies, mm. they, they grow so fast, you know? So yeah. what generally happens is it could be like this setup, there's three of us in a room working on an idea for a product or for a service or something. Yeah. And then before you know it, you blink and there's 50 people and then you blink again and there's 200 people, but you were good at coming up with your idea. You were good at maybe raising like the profile of your idea or getting a bit of investment. But that doesn't mean that you're good at managing teams or yes. um, having a vision or taking people along for the ride or communicating effectively. So what happens often is that, hey, I was a developer and you were an ideas person. And before you know it, then you have a team and I have a team and we're mm. surrounded by people that are looking to us for advice or guidance or support. Yeah. I'm the CEO, you're the CTO now. Yeah, and like we don't know what we expect from people, but like, can you just read our minds and just do it? We don't really have those skills yet to be able to like take people with us. So I think for me, I often, when I'm walking now into young companies, I'm seeing that trend where, yeah. and it's it's no one's fault. It's not, a, it's not that people missed a trick. It's just... These are the profits of success in a way. We yeah. grew so fast. Now we need to kind of catch up and put the right people in the right roles, or we need to help people with the right skills mm. to be able to cope with this new challenge. So this is where you come in, right, as a business. This is your niche. So ideally it's a company like this, a startup that's yeah. grown very quickly, which is in Amsterdam specifically, it's it's the norm. Yeah. Um, so talk us through about how like your process then with regards to like advising and because I can imagine as a leader, if something, if my company grows so quickly, it, it would be, it would take a lot for me to reach out to an external person or company mm -hmm. to like, tell me how to do my job. Does that make sense? Um, I'm a leader as a title, but maybe I don't want to look inwards to see what I'm doing wrong yeah, as a definitely. manager. I think there's definitely, there's ego can be a big component in that mix, but also I need to make things better in my business. So mm. those two things need to play off against each other. So often what will happen is that the ego will um, be in ascendance and then companies will say to me, for example, like a founder or somebody in a key leadership role will say, hey, we just need leadership training for our managers. And I'll be like, hey, great, but can I dive a little bit deeper to understand exactly what helped you to draw that conclusion? Yeah. Um, I really, I'm not interested in a quick sell. That's for me, that never really, um, marries with my value system. Like I really want to make true impact. And I think you have to know the true root cause or at least what's going on before you can decide, Hey, this is the right solution to match to the problem. Yeah. So sometimes people think they know what they want and they're right. And other times they think they know what they want, but there's actually something else going on, which could be tackled first. Yeah. And maybe there's a different like way to solve the problem. So I'd much rather help somebody find that solution, whatever it is, rather than sell them something, which is a band-aid, but doesn't actually kind of like take away the the root cause of the problem. And that tends to be the um, coaching norm, doesn't it? Just selling a one size fits all approach. Yeah. yeah, and I think I'm, I've am i grown up as a bit of a generalist. Like I've had such a long career in learning and development. I've literally worn every uniform that you can wear within like my field. So I've been a facilitator, a designer, a coordinator, a strategist, a manager, a deliverer, a coach, everything, right? So that's been really useful to kind of stretch myself into all of these different shapes and sizes. But it also means that I'm not afraid that, hey, I only sell you one thing. And if you don't pick that one thing, then I don't get a sale. So for me, I'd much rather work with somebody and pick them up as a coaching client or just give them some free advice today and then down the road they need my services for something else where I can make an impact rather than sell them something and try mm. and fit the wrong size solution in the wrong size problem. So yeah, I've kind of managed to lean on that um, flexibility yeah, and try to, again, just really meet people where they are and try to help them figure out what the problem is that they're actually facing. And talking about problems, I don't know if you want to <laughs> share with us, um, but 
Is there a recurring trend that you're seeing with clients at the moment? So I know that you do executive coaching mm -hmm. and learning and development mm -hmm. um, specialism, but is there something that keeps popping up? I think, I mean, one of the topics that comes up a lot for me at the moment as a bit of a trend is around um, culture, company culture. Right. Um, so again, companies are growing really fast. Um, at some point, they tend to have this ambition or they think that it's the right thing to kind of tie their colors to the mast somehow and say, look, this is who we are. This is what we stand for. This is what it's like here. These are our values. Yeah. Join us, you know. Um, and I love that. I think that's absolutely the right thing to do, maybe at the ro right moment in time. Um, but knowing how to do that mm. um, takes a little bit of unpacking. I've seen people make some mistakes and then have to take backward steps and then go again. Um, and other times people get really committed to saying this is who we want to be rather than this is honestly how it is here. And I yeah. think that's maybe the biggest mistake. Um, so, yeah, I've done quite a lot of work recently with different companies, different size, shapes, uh, stages of the journey where they're either looking to create and carve out their company culture, like their values, their behaviors, their mission, etc. And some that have been through that once, but now they're at a different moment. Maybe it's right. a change in direction or they have investment or the market's changing around them or they want a new identity and they've kind of outgrown their own, their old culture and they're ready to revisit that yeah so i like to re i mean i would just love to to work with founders teams whole companies with uh with this honestly yeah and culture is a sensitive topic it's a it's an interesting and fun topic but it's also quite sensitive um from just from my own experience i've been hired to dutch based companies when they just had 15 20 people okay. all speaking dutch um and they you know approached me as a freelance recruiter and said hey daisy um you know you're english speaking you're italian we would love to have a more of a international ah. environment we're going to expand to dubai we're going to expand to paris and we can't with a dutch workforce so mm -hmm. that was a really interesting experience for me because it's almost like I'm the poster girl of like the diversity um kind of campaigns but mm. it's really like a uh, it's really a responsibility for the entire company. It doesn't matter if you're mm. male or female, et cetera, what your orientation is or, yeah. yeah. So I find it really interesting how like uh, some companies used to approach me with that topic. So it's- how, uh, did you, how did you handle that out of interest? I just, well, I was a freelancer. I was paid per hour. So I just did my job. I think being an international person, an expat in Amsterdam myself, allowed other people to see like, oh, the company is inclusive and, and hires okay. not just Dutch people. But to be honest, I've done this rodeo a few times and it, it is challenging at the beginning, mm. breaking that barrier mm. and explaining to people like, oh, we're becoming this, like a right. hypothetical story. Does that make sense? It's, it's tricky. Uh, I think, you know, often when we're talking about culture, the the instinct is to talk about who we want to be. Yeah. But probably it's more healthy to at least start with a clear honest appraisal of who we are today yeah because culture is a calling card so um yeah if i was dating i wouldn't say like this is the guy i want to be you you're, you want to like advertise for real you don't want yeah. false advertising you want to say look this is actually how it is here this is how we do things here and often there's a mismatch between maybe how the founders or the top team in an organization see their company yeah. and how everybody else that's working within it or partnering with it sees that company. So I yeah. normally tackle that with, um, I start with going out into the wider company and I do culture canvas workshops. So I bring people together from cross teams, from different tenure, different disciplines. And I ask them different questions. I get them to add lots of ideas about how they actually experience the culture. Yeah. And then um, after that, then, I do a one-off half day or day with the top team that ultimately are the decision makers about the culture, the business, and I feed them all of this information and I test their reaction to it. And often that can be a really big reaction because the people in their business don't see it the same way that they see it. So you yeah. have to find that kind of crossover point. And sometimes the temptation from the top team is to say, look, just, just make it nice, just say we whatever. Let's choose the same ones as Amazon. Let's choose the, va the values that I know from other companies. They worked really well and I really like them. And I think that will be a really good um, way for us to advertise ourselves. 
And then I will just hold up the mirror and challenge them because what you say and what you do should be pretty similar. Yeah. And I start to ask questions like, so what do you reward here? And people find that quite easy. And then I say, okay, and what do you punish here? Oh, punish. And it's such a strong emotive word, right? Yeah. Like I saw the reaction on you, but people don't want to think they punish anybody for anything. But yeah. the more you stay on the topic and you hold people accountable, you give some situations. So, so you've never um, performance managed anybody. You've never um, promoted somebody over somebody else. You've never had to let somebody go. Mm. Um, you've never had to criticize or give negative feedback. Well, no, we have. Okay, so what are those situations? Let's go through those stories. So let's look at the trends. Mm. What is it? How does it actually go here? So when are you celebrating success? Who are the people or the behaviors that you're seeing, that you're holding up as like benchmarks? This is how we do it here. This is great. Let's celebrate. And yeah, this is when it's not going right. And we have to take these actions. And even if that's uncomfortable, it's, we have to do it. Probably that's the crossover between identifying the behaviors yeah. of your company culture. And I always think about it like, imagine culture is... Try not to think about it like a company culture. Try and think of, about like a person that you know, that mm. you know really well. So if you saw a person that you know really well, you care about them, you've known them for a long time. If you saw them acting a way, behaving a way that didn't match what you know they believe in. You'd call them out. You'd call them out or you'd at least be saying to other people, what's going on, you know, with Daisy? She's acting really strange. Mm. Um She's, she, she stands for this thing, but now she's doing completely the opposite thing. Or she always tells me to do it this way, and now she's doing it a different way. You'd worry about that person. And if they just lent into it and said, no, no, I'm just going to carry on, then you'd stop maybe trusting, like the congruence between what you say you'll do, what you yeah. say you stand for versus what you actually do. And for me, that's the beating heart of company culture. What you say you stand for mm. should match the way that you actually behave. Yeah. So that's a bit for me, like uh, a sweet spot. And the advantage of that for me is that you're telling, you're positively reinforcing to the people that work for your company. This is how it is. You experience it that way. That's how we are. Yeah. That's what we stand for. People can opt in or opt out of that. As long as it's honest, as long as it's real, then they know what they're choosing against. And it's the same like in your world, right, for new talent where mm. you're trying to hire people that will maybe a culture fit or a balance to your like yeah. key balance in your in your culture fit say like this is honestly how you'll experience it it's not just a line to get you to sign and join yeah. this is actually how it's going to be here are you up for that yeah and just touching base on that as well so mm. tying back to when companies scale up very quickly actually even big corporates that want someone yesterday or last week right mm. there's a lot of pressure in internal acquisition to get someone in quickly and mm. sometimes we, there's a brand new position. We haven't done our research. We don't have a wide talent pool in this. So sometimes we are under pressure as recruiters to find someone ASAP and mm. to keep in mind DEI initiatives and culture and, you know, making the company more international. Mm -hmm. It's, it can be a challenge, especially with such tight deadlines. I think that's the main, I'm sure lots of people will agree in this. For and sure. I don't think many people want to talk about it, but no. it's a huge challenge within our industry, even uh, recruitment agencies that are helping clients externally as well they need to get someone in quickly mm. particularly for example if you're looking for an IT person you know with an IT team and the manager says it's a very male driven team I need more diversity in there but you know if you look quickly at people who are immediately available etc yeah it tends to be men in that industry so it's mm. also for us like working towards deadlines making higher managers and companies happy widening our talent pool mm. Also using skill-based hiring, so not just having job titles to like widen the pool mm. to find different people that would help. Yeah. So, oh, it ties in it's, really it's well. Really, it's really tricky, right? I mean, I feel your pain. I wouldn't yeah. actually thrive doing what you do. I think I would find that um, really challenging because for me, it's more important to do the right thing than yeah. to do the, the fast thing. Um, and I know that in every job, sometimes there's that kind of... Um, yeah, you have to cross that line to get yeah. a result and you have to kind of cross your fingers and hope, okay, I, I did the best I could with what I had in the time I was given. I hope this is a fit. But I suppose it depends how far you want to zoom out. Like if, I, if I'm an organization that cares 
that much genuinely about, for example, addressing the gender balance or mm. any other balance within your organization to make it more diverse, then are you willing to take somebody that's not ready yet and train them? Yeah. Are you willing to take somebody and actually work with them that has the right kind of motivation, the right um, values, they have the right level of interest, they're on that pathway, but maybe they're not yet, yet, there yet? Are you willing to take a, a bit of a hit on getting things done right now and build that person into the into the employee that they can be for your organization yeah. and maybe that's a good litmus test in terms of how important diversity really is for you yeah is it that you just want the right person you know on your um in your organizational chart or on a video that says hey look we're really diverse look we have people from all of these different backgrounds and cultures mm. or is it that you actually believe that and you're willing to stand by that and help people to take a step that maybe they were finding hard to take yeah i think that's really different in a small growing company than it is in a larger company that can maybe have those kind of programs yeah but it's a good question to ask back yeah because you ultimately what's happening is from a recruitment perspective the company is loading up on you and saying, we find all of these things equally important. Go get us the perfect candidate. And maybe the right question is, OK, so what's more important? Somebody that can do the job right now, regardless of their background. Or somebody that fits the diversity um, aspect that you're looking for, but we might need to do a bit more with them. Yeah. You know, and I think that those are the tough questions because we want it all right. But yeah. if you can't have it all, what, what's most important to you? Yeah. 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 So it's not just filling the position, it's finding a person, a person, a, a job essentially, yeah. right? So, and there's so many different skills within professions that you can f juggle people around, or you could even like internally promote someone into that position, for example. But going back to like the startup kind of phases, yeah. I, I tend to find that, um, you know, if someone creates a business, they tend to reach out to friends of friends and, oh, do you know someone that can help me out with, xyz mm -hmm. in turn so it does become like their own little universe and they tend to speak for example if we're talking about amsterdam kind of startup they speak dutch with each other mm -hmm. they're local to each other they know each other well yep. and then branching out and becoming more yeah. uh culturally diverse that's when it becomes tricky because just tying into what we've been saying um it's it's great if we get the spec and we go out to the market and we do widen our talent pool but how do we sell that in you know like the yeah. hypotheticals like oh we're gonna be like this and this and then they can just see like on linkedin for example who works at the company and then they might be put off right yeah it goes both ways yeah right? it's, exactly it's who do we want to attract in and are they attracted by what we who we are right now and yeah. i think that's what i was saying about culture right is be honest about who you are and it can be authentic to say hey look we started out as a group of friends and contacts yeah. we've now had like a you know, this like moment of growth, we're scaling. We, just because this is where we came from doesn't mean that's who we want to be. And we want to, we recognize that we have these gaps and we would love to have a more diverse opinions, people from different backgrounds, people to add more flavor to the mix. Yeah, Like this is intentional, but not because we just want somebody that's gonna be an, a nice face on a poster, but because we recognize that that's a deficit for us for the next stage of the journey. Yeah knowing people and getting on with people in our close circle got us from like zero to one now what like what's the next stage of the journey going to look like i think it's good if you're authentic yeah and yeah. um talking more about the managerial side so we'll mm. go back into learning and development sure. later on so <clears throat> you'd also do executive coaching right so mm. you mentioned something earlier to me about being a good coach and being a good manager is is kind of goes hand in hand right so i'm just curious about your perspective mm. yeah i think it's that. yeah it's a good it's a good topic um i think often people find themselves in manager positions um which means that they were potentially like a really strong individual contributor and then that success kind of like propelled them to a position where Let's just stick more people around this good person. And then hopefully that person's like experience will rub off on these other people. And then they can also be mini versions of that person. And that's not taking into account any of the skills that that person would now need to have as a people manager. And those are such different skills than the skills perhaps that they had that made them a successful individual contributor. So these situations happen. Um, and the question you're asking is about coaching. I think coaching is one of those skills that would be a really useful and helpful for a new manager to develop yeah because 
you're now working with people that are not you. So you probably can't mold them into exact replicas of yourself. They come from different, they have different ideas. They have different ways of working. Um, they have different thoughts, fears, hopes, dreams, problems. And if you just treat them the way that you've excelled in, I'll just treat them the way that people treated me. And that worked for me. So that's good enough. Mm. Probably that won't work for everyone. So then you have to kind of like take a step back and think, how do I get the best out of this person? I'm probably going to have to ask them some questions. Mm. I'm going to have to try and figure out what's going on with them. And maybe that sounds really basic, but I see it as like a key blocker. So often with managers of all experience levels that their, ex their conversations are principally operational conversations. So they're talking about the work, but there are, there are problems in the work. Sometimes mm. the work isn't going right. And the way they're trying to solve that is with a work solution, but sometimes the solution isn't, the problem isn't a work problem. It could be an emotional problem. It could be a family problem. It could be a work-life balance problem. It could be a not getting on with my colleagues problem. It could be a uh, imposter syndrome problem. It yeah. could be a I need development problem. The only way you're going to find that out is to build enough trust, ask questions and really care about what the other person is saying, and then act on the stuff that they tell you. So essentially, you don't want to be friends with the people that you manage, but you do want to be friendly. Yeah. So you want to build trust. You want them to feel that it's okay to open up and let, let you know what's going on beneath the surface. And believe that the reason you're asking these questions is with the positive intent that you want to help that unlock that problem and get them going again. Yeah. And so it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation, mm. right? You have to build that trust, but you don't often start with that trust for people. They'll be like a bit guarded. Yeah. So your what comes first, your actions or your words? You know, for some people, you'll be able to demonstrate, build trust through the things that you do. Mm. And they think, ah, this looks like a safe place to be able to have that conversation. Let me also test that and open up with my manager. Other times it's just about saying, look, I really want to know what's going on. And I, you know, I, I want to have a relationship with you where I can help you. And I'm going to ask you some questions and only answer the ones that you feel comfortable with. But I, I guarantee this is only because I want to help you yeah. and see if you can help that person to, to unlock. Yeah. yeah. And it's also challenging if you're not used to that you know yeah. if you're a new leader or even if you're a seasoned leader as well and you're not that person you know you're not looking to reach out to colleagues you, right. know, you keep to yourself you're right. also busy with your own schedule and then comes the topic of remote working mm. so i've had teams based across europe right. even in the us and adding that on top of everything you just said all the challenges just amplifies it even more is that how you've experienced it to include someone who's not based locally you know if, especially if you've got culture where it's you know you go to the office two three times a week mm -hmm. um i'm i'm a people person so i like to be in front of people rather than zoom so i've had to learn as a leader over the years to foster this type of culture remotely as mm. well virtually like how do you get how do you make someone feel included mm. in a company just as people going into the office feel included yeah. does that make sense it so does make loads sense. of challenges and i think it's something i experienced which i wasn't expecting is that when when covid hit and everyone had to work from home for the first time i at that time i was leading a team i think of about 25 people direct reports oh, so almost wow. all of my time was spent talking with my people right um before COVID, we would be sitting in one big area and then going off and doing our individual learning, quality, training uh, related tasks. So people were always at my desk. We were rotating around who would sit where. So I thought I pretty much know everyone about the same as each other. Mm. Uh, but there are some people that it just goes easier with yeah. and some people which are, you know, maybe it's just a personality thing or... Um, but I wasn't as close with. And then the fu something funny happened. When I started having remote one-to-ones, for the people that things had been really good with in close proximity, that was the challenge that you described. Mm. They felt further away. They felt a bit isolated. It was difficult to connect with the overall mission somehow. But some of the people that I had struggled with suddenly got way closer to me. Mm. And it was like, wow, this channel 
which felt like a kind of handicap, just turned into like a amplifier. Yeah. And we were having meaningful conversations. I was getting way many more skins deeper on the onion and finding out what was really going on for that person and able to help that person way more. And it happened with, I think, five people. Yeah. So it just goes to show that we think that there's like a best solution mm. for every situation. But I really think it does come down to the individual. Yeah. And it's about figuring out like what's what works and does not work for this person. Yeah. For example, I would always tell like managers now, maybe you'll maybe have your one to one with a coffee or maybe take them into a neutral like coffee house rather than at desk or maybe just go for a walk around the block. Yeah. Um, some people thrive in a video call yeah. where they've got everything around them. They're, they're in their own safe environment. So if, ask them, like, what works best for you? Yeah. If you can meet them where they need you to be, then you're serving them, you know? Yeah, because it's not, as managers, it's not about us. Totally. At the end of the day, it's about the, no. the workforce around us, the yeah. teams. I've I've had to learn that lesson more than once, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I think just, I've been a manager now for the last three years, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, the first person I managed was someone completely remote. Um, mm -hmm. I met him once or twice in the Amsterdam office, and then he was based in Bulgaria mm. the whole time. So that was huge for me at the beginning, just to be dumped with this situation. But yeah, I just had to learn how to like communicate and communication is, and listening, I think, are our strongest skills Definitely. as managers, not talking over people and our expertise and being better than everyone. Yeah. It's literally understanding your audience, like what do Absolutely. they want. You're almost like a vessel as a manager, aren't you? And you're, you're executing what your your team wants you to do, essentially. I think you, I think you say it really beautifully. Um, so how how have you changed as a manager over those three years? What, what have you learned? <laughs> Interviewing me. Um, <laughs> I think I've started, it's challenging still, I'm not going to lie. It's a continuous process because if you manage at different companies and different teams and different people, it comes with different challenges not everyone's the same Agreed. i've learned i can't categorize sorry mm -hmm. i can't categorize people in the same boxes oh you're an introvert you prefer working from home that's not true you're an extrovert you should be in the office four mm -hmm. days a week not true so like you said just really communicating asking loads of open-ended questions building that trust but easier said than done it it can take some time yeah it can take months it can take a day it just depends on again who your audience is and who your team members are so to answer your question i'm still learning i'm a lifelong learner <laughs> um if you have any suggestions for example for new leaders who are resonating with this and maybe don't want to reach out to experts for help but can mm -hmm. just get a quick tip from you uh, yeah. on this podcast for sure i mean i think the biggest and most easy one to do if you will give yourself permission is to do a 360 just to honestly ask the people it can be people you directly manage or people that are your peers that you work most closely with just ask them two or three questions it doesn't have to take more than five minutes you have to frame it right like hey i'm really open for feedback i really want you to be honest um i'm doing this because i want to improve so tell me what you think my greatest strengths are you know any any uh, development areas that you that you can see for me or anything else you'd like me to know yeah is and, this at the yeah, beginning of your, of your journey or any point and you can do it regularly you know i think the more regularly that you um, demonstrate your willingness to improve as a manager and that you're open to other people giving you feedback guess what people will become more open and they'll be more responsive to your feedback because we're saying essentially we're just trying to improve together. So you help me and I'll help you. The more you give me, the better I can serve you. Yeah. The better that I serve you, hopefully the better you'll perform. So it's a two-way street. And I think that often people get a bit nervous mm. to say, I don't know whether I want to open Pandora's box or maybe it's better that I just live by my assumptions and I think everyone's fine and I'm doing a great job. Mm. But if you, can, if you can authentically ask for feedback and people feel that that's a genuine request and that they can be honest without persecution or without any kind of like kickback yeah then you've started and normally there will be clues there and if you can act on those things and say hey essentially you guys told me that this is something i can do better i'm now working on it mm. and then they see you putting things into action 
it's a huge driver and motivator in a relationship with your team because you're saying i'm not the finished product yeah. i'm learning to and i want to be better for you i'm actually acting on the things that you give me i think it's very disarming and often management can feel very hierarchical mm. and we hear all the time like it's a flat hierarchy everyone's talking around the water cooler anyone can make a suggestion most of the time that's bullshit yeah because what actually happens is the person that has more seniority is making decisions and everybody else is following them yeah. and maybe if you have a great idea it will get heard but for the most part it's not a direct line up to the decision makers but in teams you can flatten that hierarchy and say look we have different jobs. Mm. My role is to make sure this team performs well. So I'm actually invested in you doing a great job. Yeah. So if I can, you can tell me how I can help you to perform well and you do perform well, we both win. Yeah. So I'm not higher or lower than you. I'm just actually doing a different job. Yeah. So let's give each other feedback along the way. I think there's some imposter syndrome with that. Um, you know, you're kind of evaluating yourself every day. Like, did I do the right thing? Did I tell my team the right thing am mm -hmm. i doing things correctly and then there's also this stereotype that if you're in a leadership position whether you're new to it or 10 years in that you're an expert in it and you shouldn't ask for help right and you shouldn't feel like that right that you should be comfortable with with wearing decision making hats mm -hmm. and but that's why with the imposter syndrome side like if you do reach out to people this is just coming from my experience mm -hmm. asking for help or if i seem uncertain about a decision or i don't know what to do it just makes me feel like I'm weaker, even though it might not be true. Yeah. But I think that's what people are afraid of. Agreed. I and I think it's, a, it's not a, a fear for genuine reasons. It's actually more, there's more going on in your head mm. than in reality. And if you look around and model some of the people that you've seen grow or perform well, they are nearly always, like you said earlier, I'm a lifelong learner. They're nearly always looking for ways to personally improve. So they're actually using it as a strength to ask for advice, to take feedback, to self-reflect, yeah. to be open about their the things they develop, they're trying to work on. And yet something gets lost in translation where we're like, oh, that works for them as high performers. But yeah, I wouldn't want to show that level of vulnerability and ask these questions. Mm. I'll, I'm better off just if everybody thinks I'm good and I don't like rock the boat then maybe nobody will notice that I don't know what I'm doing. And I think that's what imposter syndrome is, basically. It's, it's something not real. It's mist over the eyes where you're not seeing the world as it truly is because you're governed by fear. Yeah, you're in your head. You're in your head. And the moment you let more people in, the more you recognize what you do need to concentrate on and maybe some things you don't. For example when I've had like imposter syndrome before, that's meant that sometimes I've been doing the right things. But rather than qualifying and checking that that was working for people, I thought, this isn't working. And I went for another option and then another one. So I was reaching out, trying different solutions when actually the first one was working. I could have put my focus on something else mm. and kept on doing what I was doing with this thing. But in my own head, I was thinking, this isn't working. But mm. I didn't actually stop to ask the people that it was impacting the most. So it seems a bit silly. You would give yourself the advice. You'd give somebody else that advice, right? Like, hey, yeah. have you asked anyone? Is this working for them? But something blocks us from doing it. Mm. Yes, very thought provoking. <laughs> I'm definitely thinking to all of the times that I've been reluctant to ask for help. And, oh, I'm I'm a manager. Clearly, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. I need to just go with my gut. Um, and sometimes those decisions have been completely wrong. And I should have just asked the team in the beginning, you know, in, in a team meeting, like, hey, this is the situation. That's also another case, right, where you, like you said, you don't want to be friends with your team, but you want to be friendly. Mm -hmm. And like, how much information do you share as a leader? That's also yeah. a fine line. Do I tell them everything about the business or just do I shield them? Yeah. And protect them from yeah. everything that's going on. That's such a fine line I've noticed. Agreed. I'm not sure that I have like the uh, a single answer to that question because I think every situation is a bit unique. Yeah. I've definitely experienced it as a manager where I feel like I'm in the sandwich. Yeah. Where there's a kind of NDA or there's key critical information which I have been trusted with, but I am not permitted to pass on. 
But on the other side, I'm trying to support and help people that are anxiously waiting maybe for information about yeah. their future, about the business, about the team. So that does put you in a bit of a situation. I'm normally, I've normally tackled that with honesty. Yeah. To say, if there is anything that I know that I'm able to tell you, I will. I hope that you trust that I will do that. Yeah. It's never comfortable to maybe know something 24 hours before the rest of the team. That's a burden that I have to carry. Mm. Um, I wouldn't be helping you or the business if I was to break that confidence. So help me to do my job by giving me the trust yeah. that I will tell you what I can as soon as I can. And in those situations, I think like I've been going, I've been through like um, restructures, redundancies, uh, big changes in direction, mergers, all those things that really worry employees yeah um i've i've taken one like um tip for myself that i've really held on to which is don't fall into the trap of giving your personal opinion Can so you go into that a bit more yeah so it's a bit strange but you know for example imagine you're on the phone to customer services of uh, a company where you're having a bad experience as a customer you know that the person that you're speaking to is just Chris from customer services and probably did not, is not at fault for the problem that you had. But as far as you're concerned, I'm company X. Mm. I'm the company you're talking to. So you're going to talk to me. You're going to take out your frustration on me. Anything I say, you're going to hold me accountable for. So even though I just want to help you and maybe I don't have the power to give you exactly what the solution you want, you're holding me accountable. You're seeing me as that company. And I think the same standard is true, even with people you know really well in your team. Mm. When they're anxious for news, if you start to give your personal opinion, even if you say, hey, look, this is not what I've been told, it's just what I think might happen, people will hear, this is what's really happening. He's mm. trying to give us a clue. Yeah. So I think there's danger in it, even though the, the feeling inside is, hey, I feel compelled to try and help, to soften, to make things better than maybe they are, to... Um, reassure people to take away the worry. If I'm not act basing that on facts or facts that I'm allowed to give, then I'm taking a big risk. And mm. people will hold you accountable for that. Yeah. So you're putting yourself essentially in a kind of lose-lose situation. Yeah. So as hard as it is, I really try, try to be clinical with what I'm allowed to say, honest with my boundaries, and then supportive without giving my personal opinion. And yeah, that's a really tough juggling act. I have it to say. is. Yeah. yeah, it's you have to be strategic. Yeah, as a manager, I've learned this as well the hard way. Because um, yeah, like you said, if you put your opinion on certain things happening within the company, people take it as gospel. Yeah. Um, and oh, Daisy said this, or Chris said this, and and then it gets around, and it's not even true, you know. So it's just. Yeah. It's it's a tough balancing act, isn't it? Like doing justice to your team being on their side being their biggest cheerleader and mm -hmm. also their biggest um supporters and being true to the business mm -hmm. as well it's it's incredibly difficult i don't think i think when people aren't in a leadership position and they see managers they think oh they've got it all mm -hmm. they've got like a nice salary they've got x benefits they get to manage teams and grow teams they have so much like responsibility mm. um, and freedom but that's so far from so far from the truth. Yeah, I think there's different ways of looking at it. I think it's natural to sort of look over and think the grass is always greener. Mm. There's probably times when I've been a manager when I thought it would be so much easier just to be an individual contributor right now and yeah. just I can complete my work and go home and tomorrow I can come back fresh without sort of taking anything with me. So I think a lot of it comes down to like personality type mm. and your natural feeling as a person. For me, Often what made you a great individual contributor is rarely the same set of behaviors, competencies, feelings, values that will make you a great manager. Sometimes mm. there's crossover, but often it's a sort of new category. You know, I, I'm always thinking about being a great manager means serving other people. It means um, shining a light on others mm. rather than stepping into the spotlight myself. It yeah. means like role modeling. It means being like having humility. It means that I take pleasure in seeing other people grow. Yeah. And 
that is my personal reward, even though it's a bit invisible. So you have to be prepared to take that step back and put other people ahead of you. And I think that you are either a bit like that, or that's a really difficult set of shoes to walk in because yeah. they just feel a bit uncomfortable. Um, you're used to being the one in, in the, the limelight. Spotlight. You're used to being the one that was the high achiever. You're used to being the one that role modeled what good looked like. And now you're having to say, except that people will do it a different way than you did it, but they can still get results. Mm. So, yeah, I think it's a big challenge to make that uh, to make that jump, honestly. So you had a leadership position uh, at Booking, right, before you went freelance. And now you have a completely different scope um, mm. being an entrepreneur. So talk us through about the journey with that then. So okay. you were at Booking for how many years? I think eight, seven or eight, six, seven, eight years, something like this. Yeah, wow. it, was, it was really my reason for coming to the Netherlands. I, you know, it was the company I came for, um, working in a really international environment. It was so exciting to start working at Booking for like so many different reasons. I was living in a new country. Everybody was essentially an expat. It was the most multicultural, super exciting place to be. At the same time, there were some like big differences. I, I'd been working for a, um, a utilities company in the UK, which was like highly compliant, health and safety, a process for everything. And Booking was this huge company, mm. like global company already. But it was still walking around in like the kind of um, clothes of a startup or mm. something. So it was still trying to be really um, keep that spirit of being young, fresh, open to new ideas. I walked into the office, I think, for one of the first times. And there was people stood on computer chairs wearing flip flops, trying to attach like Halloween decorations to light fittings. And I was like... Working at height, wrong footwear, um, <laughs> a paper on electricity, fire hazard. Um, and, you know, people were just laughing at me like, yeah, there's no one else to do it here. We just do stuff for ourselves, you know. So it was a bit of a culture shock in that way. But the positives like were just so rewarding. So working, f you know, learning so much from different people coming from different places. Um, quite quickly, I moved out of uh, a learning role as an individual contributor and started managing the team that I'd been part of. And so I knew everybody and I'd been a manager of big teams before. Mm. So I was like, well, I know that I have to meet people where they are. I know I have to serve people. Um, I know I have to lift other people up, but there were like completely new lessons to learn working in an international environment. I remember I was delivering one of my first ever team meetings. I think my team was like 20 to 25 people, everybody physically there. So stood around together, sat around together. I think my team had more than 15 different nationalities represented. So it was like truly everybody came from a different place. And I was just giving some, I think quite standard meeting instructions. Hey, there's a new piece of work coming. It's for this reason. This is how we're gonna tackle it. I believe we can do it. Let's go. And I said that in my English way, which would have been completely fine in my previous job. Everyone seemed okay in the moment. But as soon as I went back to my desk, my inbox started going. And then people started approaching me. Hey, can we have a one-to-one? -one? Can I talk? And I thought, what's going on? Did I say something wrong? Or, And then I had sort of a series of conversations with individuals in my team where everybody had a different viewpoint on the meeting that I just delivered. Wow. So I thought it was something very basic. I thought it had gone just fine. Some people were saying, Chris, thank you so much. At last, a clear message. You were really motivational. I know exactly what I have to do. Crystal clear. I just wanted to pass on the feedback. Great. Oh, yeah. That, that's how I also experienced it. Then somebody else. Do you have to use such long words? I'm not a native English speaker and I don't understand what you're saying. It's very confusing. I still don't know what, what we're doing. Oh, okay, sorry, let me uh, rephrase it. I'm sorry that I wasn't clear. Somebody else literally slammed a door and said, the way that you speak, you use too many words. It comes across as deceitful. I don't trust what's really going on here. And I was thinking, can all of these different reactions have come from this one simple, like, handover of, uh, of information? So I was, I was in shock, honestly. I was thinking, am I going to be fit to manage a team of people that come from different places? And I remember going home and thinking, and maybe this sounds so stupid now looking back, but I was thinking, oh, 
culture is not just about the food that people eat, the clothes that they wear, the mm. accent they have. It's about how they model the world. It's about how they experience the same words in a different way. It's about their belief systems. It's about authenticity. They all require something else from me. I'm going to have to completely change my style to make sure that everybody gets what they need from me. Mm. And that was a huge shift for me in terms of mindset because it wasn't a one size fits all approach anymore. It was really cutting it up into as many pieces as I needed to for people to get what they needed from me. Yeah. Huge task. Yeah. Huge shift from what you've been doing. Yeah. It was before. It was a big one. I think like what I learned from that is I normally keep it quite direct and concise now when delivering the first level of information. Right. And then I invite people to ask questions and to talk and people will tell you where they're struggling or what they need or to go into more detail or the, what's the motivation. Or, so I let them kind of drive in a way. Okay. So I say, let me just put this out in a nutshell, but then we're going to stay here for as long as we need to. So everybody gets what they need and they leave with what they have, what they need in their hand yeah. to be able to go and move forward. So you're not like leading the meeting that the team members yeah. are, are exactly coordinating it essentially yeah, exactly right and and ultimately as a manager you're always trying to get yourself out of the way to connect people to the work so what do you need from me to help you understand what's required and mm. that you're clear on it and then mission accomplished you know but yeah it is definitely a shift from being prescriptive to people yeah. to being more like hey what do you actually need to to be able to move forwards with this yeah it's a collaborative approach mm. i think it's it's an interesting way of doing it. I've not heard of this being done before. I've not experienced it myself, but I can imagine that this is a far more effective way of getting everyone on board, collaborating, as opposed to, oh, I'm just going to monologue for 20 minutes about right. in a town hall about what's going on right? and then not take any questions. I exactly. presume everyone understands. Yeah, you've got it. And, and of course, the good thing is it doesn't have to stay like that because as you build trust and people know what to expect from each other, then they start to be able, you, you can move a bit faster. Mm. So you, people know how you talk. They know how you explain things. They know you do things with positive intent. You know that they know and trust that you're there to support them. So the wheels speed up. Yeah. But through action, demonstrating I will do what I say I will do. So we can probably get there quicker in future meetings. But to start with, it was really, yeah. You have to break the ice. Has to break the ice and get and build that trust. Yeah. And did you do the same thing for seven, eight years or you progressed? Into no, I had lots of different jobs, roles, responsibilities. And, and also the business changed quite a lot, honestly. So sometimes I was really strategic. Other times I was like completely operational, like spending my whole days, like coordinating groups of new hires. Sometimes we would have hundreds of new hires per month. Wow. So it was really fast moving and across all of uh, EMEA. So sometimes it was project based. Sometimes it was purely leadership. And yeah, at times it was leadership development. So right. yeah, it was, again, pretty interesting. And it I never really felt like I was wanting to move because it was, booking was always giving me the next challenge and something new to kind of keep my attention and drive me forward. Yeah. Um, so what did happen? Mm, yeah, well, <laughs> I think, I think it was that like strange year of um, the beginning of COVID um, me and my fiance had a child. There were potentially restructure happening in the business. It felt like everything was changing mm -hmm. in a way. And I was really trying to be there for my team, for my business. I was very loyal. But then my mailbox started to go crazy with um, job offers. And oh. I mean, I'd always had like a, a a constant trickle. And I think like having booking on your CV and, you know, my profile was good. But it kind of went crazy. I don't know if you can um, yeah, contextualize this in, from your world, but it seemed like L&D suddenly went like really high up the pecking order in terms of what companies were looking for. Yeah, recruitment was like, we were like software developers. Like right. I'd have like between five to seven. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's per day. Yeah. It's quite a lot of messages. Yeah, I can, I can echo that. So it was like that. And it was getting more aggressive. Like it wasn't, hey, would you like to talk about about this role, which we think you'd be a great fit for. It was like, we need someone to start like at the beginning of the month. Do you want it? 
like you don't need to talk to anyone um and i was like whoa what's going on and my reaction was really um looking back i'm sort of like analyzing myself but i was really rejecting that so i was mm. either not opening them or i was sending a polite kind of template reply to say thanks for your interest but i'm really happy where i am and then one message dropped into my linkedin that caught my attention mm. I still don't really know why it caught me, but you know, sometimes it just happens. The right day, right time. Right. So, and the message was kind of like, hey, I know you probably get a million of these, but I want to be one million and one. How would you like to set up your own learning and development department? You have full control for a really exciting scale up. And I was like, I'm going to go and meet this person. Mm. And... I was speaking to Deb, my fiance, and said, and she was saying, why, why this one? And I was saying, I don't know. I just feel something and I'm just going to go and I have to go and find out. Mm. I had a, one meeting sitting down in looking around the office. It was worlds apart from booking, right? So booking was like eight or nine offices in Amsterdam alone. And I was traveling between all of them and everything was like super established restaurants, training rooms, you know, meeting rooms. And this was really like we've got two desks and we're going to get another one. And uh, tomorrow we're going to get a coffee machine. And it was really like at the beginning wow. of setting up an office um, for a startup. And I thought, okay, this would be a big gear change. But the conversation got me hooked. And when I was leaving, I was riding my scooter home through the streets of Amsterdam and I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck still going. And I thought, spidey sense. Something is telling me that this is for me. And I went home and I said to Deb, I think I'm going to go for this. And she said, okay, but what are you getting yourself into? You know, because yeah. startup is so different from where you are right now. Um, and I said, I just think that I, I always had this itch to go and try startup life, but maybe I thought that the moment was gone. Mm. And I think that it's going to be radical. I think it's going to be rapid change. I think I'm going to be asked to do things I and I'm not expecting, and I want to find out whether I, if I'm trying to surf on those waves, do I stay on my board or I do, do I go under? Yeah. And let's just find out. And maybe I have to go back, but I think I need to know and I'm going to regret not finding out. And uh, that's what happened, basically. Um, it was completely different. It was like nothing I'd experienced before. I thought that booking was like rapid change. But this was like supersonic. Did you have to start everything from scratch? Yeah, which was the good thing. I wanted to start everything from scratch. I wanted to buy my own tools, create my own processes, meet everyone, set everything up, build a team. And I was doing those things and that was really fun. But then outside of that, the world was just going so fast. Like, for example, on the same week that I was signing to say, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll join. The company was also taking $80 million investment from one of the biggest investors in the world. And so, you know, you see that like rocket ship emoji on all startups. Mm. This was like with rocket fuel in it. So suddenly mm. poof, we mm. were like, ooh, like going as fast as you can. And yeah. there was no time to really think, to question, to yeah. doubt anything. I was being asked to do things that were so far away from my scope at short notice. And sometimes I was like lying in bed at night saying to Deb, oh shit, I've made a huge mistake. Mm. And she was saying, but yeah, what's happening? And to her credit, she like really held up the mirror. And I was saying, they're asking me to do things that I wasn't expecting. I'm out of my comfort zone. It's rich. She said, those are the things that you said that you wanted. You were expecting this. So come on, believe in yourself, go for it. And uh, I'm so glad that she did that because I kind of went back. I, I really trusted myself. And things went really well. So projects landed. I had experiences I would never normally have, like reaching into all different parts of the business, meeting and understanding how those parts of the machine work in a way that I was never exposed to in a purely L&D role before. And as that imposter syndrome that we were talking about earlier started mm. to kind of like demist, I was looking around and I was thinking, oh, everybody here is really young i mean everyone the employees are young the managers are young the investors are young the founders are young i'm the oldest person here and they're all so smart and maybe that's why i was feeling 
imposter syndrome because it felt like everybody was doing so well and so like smart and such specialists. But when I got over that kind of thought process about should I have gone faster in my career, like was I, have I missed a trick? Mm. I started to also see, yeah, they're smart, but they are lacking some experience. And that mm. experience is surfacing up in a way that I am seeing that's really impactful to the people. So they're great at doing their jobs, but they often don't have a great relationship with their manager or in, they don't feel a sense of belonging in their team or managers are not sure how to communicate effectively with their people. Or, or they're skipping steps. Right. I mean, there, there was so much trust and autonomy that you just had to kind of cross your fingers and hope that everybody did what they were supposed to do and it all came together. So that wasn't that cohesion I was used to. And people were desperate for it. So when I started having like one-to-one -one conversations with random people in the business, people were like opening up and saying, I'm not feeling good. Uh, I, I need something else. I'm not being heard, whatever it is. And so I was kind of fixing, putting people together and kind of like um, matchmaking people to have like better conversations. And I think that that startup life, I mean, there's no getting away from it. That's the reality. And mm. it's not, it's definitely not a criticism of this company. I think they did an amazing job scaling so quick. But what I noticed was huge gaps and opportunities for somebody like me with experience in helping teams form, think how people work, building relationships, building culture. Yeah. Um, where I thought my experience is helping people at all levels of this business. And probably I could do this for more businesses. Yeah. Yeah. And this is where your entrepreneurship journey began or? Yeah, kind of. Uh, again, I didn't really push for it. Somebody approached me and said, hey, look, how about with what I can offer and what you can offer, we team up and we go out and we do this together. I think it can work. And Did was, you know this person before? I knew them. Yeah, I knew them. Um, but I, I wasn't imagining that was going to happen. But I'm so glad it did because that person gave me the confidence to do something I never would have done on my own. I didn't really have the guts to do it on my own because I, I relish team. You know, I just love collaboration. Mm. So I really wanted to take that leap of faith, but I just didn't want to do it solo. So someone saying, come on, we can do it together was enough for me. And it, event it ended up being three of us. Oh, nice. So that's why we have kind of people, talent, culture, learning, kind of this HR crossover with L&D in, in Kix, which is our company. And yeah, that was what I needed to get going. And yeah, honestly, so far, I don't regret it. It's it's a wild ride being an yeah. entrepreneur. Maybe you heard that a few times on your podcast yes. already. Um, <laughs> There's more times that you don't feel like you know what you're doing than you do feel like you know what you're doing. But if you can hold on for the ride, it's really rewarding. And Kicks, I can kind of picture where that name comes from, but how did you come up with that What's name? What's your guess? That you kick companies up the arse <laughs> to do what they're supposed to do. Yeah, well, we have this kind of um, like, yeah, motto, like from kicking off to scaling up. Uh, so, yeah, we want to help companies that are really early stage and they haven't had to think about learning or HR or people or culture yet, but now it's coming sharply into focus. They, they want to scale and they recognize that they need a solution mm -hmm. in those parts of the business. They have those gaps and they don't really know how to fill them. Um, and normally what happens is one of two things. So let's say, for example, you're you and me made a company, you were the ideas person, I was the tech person, we got some money, we moved out of our garage, we suddenly have a group of people. Those people are employees and suddenly they're not just our friends, they are people that want benefits mm. and uh, when do I get paid? And um, I wanna buy a house, can I have a permanent contract and all that kind of stuff. And if I get sick, what happens? Um, I wanna improve, I wanna learn something. I need an onboarding that sets me up for success so all these new problems are surfacing mm. and we don't have the skills to be able to do that we just had an idea and i would develop something and suddenly we have these new challenges so normally we tackle that or founders tackle that one of two ways they either go let's let's buy in an experienced member of staff now that can own this mm. but that's kind of high risk because what they're doing is they're saying, we're going to basically take a full-time employee, even though we're super small, 10 people, 50 people, and we're going to bank on that one person is going to take us through all of the stages that we need to go through. They're going to cost a lot. And what happens if it doesn't work out, you know? So they're kind of gambling a little bit on mm. experience. 
or more commonly, they do the other, the complete opposite. And they say, let's just take a really junior person and give them load up on them and give them an opportunity to learn everything through doing. So um, we need payroll, we need HR, we need this, we need a tool. We, and that person is trying their best, maybe alongside study or in their first job mm. to be this, you know, really senior HR, HR personality. Yeah. And they don't yet have the experience or even know where to start. Mm. And so both of those things are kind of a big risk. And so the way that we help is we say, rather than do those th things, how about taking somebody from Kicks? We bring all of the experience. We've been through this before. We're going to set everything up for you on an assignment. Or we'll just guide your junior person and we'll kind of consult. Mm. We'll get things set up and then we'll leave again. There's no risk. So we get you going. We set things up for success. We train your people if necessary. And once you're ready, we don't overstay our welcome. We're happy to, to move on to our next project. And then we come back and support you at later stages of the journey if you need us. Yeah. Um, and that's worked really well. So that's what people need. So there is definitely appetite for that. And then more on my side, like it's been more like project based. So companies are saying, we have a problem to solve. It's, we think it's a learning one. Can you help us? And then I kind of go into consultation and see if it's something that we can support. Companies must be so grateful when you help like this as opposed to, because this is a very different business model than what I've heard before, right. which is people normally are freelancers in learning and development or executive coaching, and they will go into a company for six months, 12 months, yeah. and then actually work in-house for them whilst you're actually doing, you're taking all of that out and just only the good bits, you're keeping everything as it is and just consulting and elevating yeah. their company. That's a really good way to describe it. And Your new motto. Yeah, <laughs> thank joking. you. No, but, that, but that is really it. And, and, you know, the thing, the principal thing that we bring is experience and that we really want to help. And I think that if you package those two things together, then most people feel that. Yeah. And there's been times that we've turned down an opportunity to take a, a job just because we felt that we weren't the right solution or that they thought that they needed something that they didn't need. And I would much rather stand by that. And I would recommend honestly anybody in, in like entrepreneurship to have that, you know, to put your feet on the ground and say, look, this is what I stand for. I'm only going to sell you something where I feel that I can make impact mm. because ultimately you, you are your own product. So if it doesn't go great, guess what? That will damage your reputation. If you didn't move the needle, people will notice that. Mm. So they'll be like, so we paid you for what? So I always want to be confident that if I'm coming in, it's to do something that's going to actually help you. It will be measurable. And then hopefully you'll recommend me. And that's, I would much rather that, honestly. Yeah, operate with transparency and yeah. honesty as opposed to just getting a quick buck, getting a client mm. whenever you can. And that's practiced a lot. I see, especially in, in Amsterdam, in the UK, people who freelance, they're worried about stability and income. So they'll just take any odd job, right? Of course. That's not aligned with them. Yeah. And then and then what happens is you you tend to not be authentic because you're trying to stretch to be something that you're actually not. So then you're selling yourself as a specialist, but actually you're only maybe just making it by your fingernails, you know? Mm. And I think that that's, you're at risk of either being exposed or delivering a substandard service. So I'd much rather say, that's not what I do, or I'm not the right person for this. I can recommend somebody else. I would much rather do that. Mm. And that organization gets what they actually need. Yeah. And hopefully then that becomes you know, a community of people that actually help each other and lift each other up rather than everybody out for the, for themselves, you know? Yeah. I'm seeing it in the recruitment industry as well. Um, it's quite saturated now because of COVID there was an influx of recruiters. Everyone needs a tech recruiter, right? Right. And now there's too many of us in the market. So I've seen people becoming experts on LinkedIn algorithm mm. and uh, personal branding and LinkedIn banners. Like they're offering very different services than recruiting or career coaching just to fit into the niche yeah. in the market at the moment even yeah. though they they know some things about it they're not necessarily qualified in that and it's not their niche but they're just taking mm -hmm. whatever they can and it's like you said you need to be your authentic self you are an expert of the xyz for a reason um so you have to just stay with that i think even if the market's shifting it's changing I think as an entrepreneur, your ethos should kind of, you should evolve as a company. For sure. With the trends, but keep the 
the structure the same, right? Keep the yeah. services. Yeah. Be good at something. I think, you know, be good at something, lean into that. And if you see that that market is closing and there's no longer in a market for that, then get good at something else. I'm not saying you can never change lanes. I think that that's absolutely, I believe in continuous learning. I believe in, you know, that that necessity to keep upskilling and changing for an evolving marketplace is happening at in corporates, you know, in startups, in entrepreneurship, it's happening everywhere. If you stay still, you'll probably feel like you're moving backwards because mm. the rest of the world is learning new things. So I don't, I'm not saying here, you're stuck with it, just do what you've always done, but become an expert. Mm. Actually, if you're going to sell yourself as a specialist, then actually be a specialist in that thing and be driving towards learning more, have that appetite to become the best that you can be. And um, yeah, th at least that's the way I see it. But maybe that's an old man talking. <laughs> you picked a good niche as well with learning and development. I feel like it's evolving, but the core value of learning and development stays the same. But the ways you teach people, for example, mm -hmm. there's companies that are doing it via TikTok videos now. Mm -hmm. So shorter, easier to digest kind of content to yeah. learn something new as opposed to having a person face to face, teaching 20, 30, 40 yeah. people face to face. So the value stays the same but it's been done in different ways 100 percent. and again i don't jump on every trend but i'm always curious now actually i don't <laughs> do tiktoks but i do but like and maybe that's again a generational thing but i've always believed in micro learning so short impactful um learning bites and often that would take the form of an engaging video so before tiktok was a thing L and D were already kind of occupying that space and saying, we know people's attention span is going down. We know they don't want to go through lots of before and after to get to the the actual meat of the sandwich. So like give it to me, give to me what you were going to give in a one hour training session in a one minute or a 30 second video. Wow. I would prefer that. And if I want to reach for more information, just help me link to where I can go and find out more. People have an appetite for going and finding learning when they need it. Mm. You know, we are a Google generation. No one in the workplace basically now that I see grew up having to wait to be taught out of a book or in a class. If they wanted to know something, they just researched it for themselves online and they got the immediate information they wanted. And workplaces have to catch up with that mindset. So if you're stuck still delivering one way content, which still has a place, mm. but it's not the it's not the solution for all problems. Yeah. If people are waiting to be enrolled on a course to find out something that they could have researched on themselves in five minutes, you won't get people signing up for that course. Mm. You know, so you have to find the right solution for the right thing. AI, people are using AI as a co-pilot now. So you don't need someone that's an expert in the manual of how you do things. You can just ask your in-house AI, how do I do this? What's the best thing to say here? What does our guidebook say? And it will give you a kind of real-time answer. So yeah. making, guiding people to how they can get the, the answers that they need is a huge advantage for learning and development. I think many people in my profession are seeing this as a huge threat and yeah. I get it. I mean, I do get it. But for me, there's knowledge. So people need to be able to understand things before they can take actions and then there's skills behaviors putting that knowledge into action so if you can shortcut knowledge and people can get what they need real time they can get answers quicker when they need it now you can focus on how well they put that into action and that's where the magic happens so i'm actually happy if a co-pilot or a micro learning or a tiktok video can get people yeah understanding things better now we can talk about and how are you going to actually act interact with your customer with your colleague with your employee etc and that's where we can focus on skills you know where performance happens it's good that you're excited about it i mm -hmm. i feel the same that it's an add-on to our current skills and our professions as opposed to oh it's going to take over our jobs i was going to ask you like do you feel like you will be replaced by google and ai in a few years time um i mean i've always been conscious throughout my career of like the shelf life of in terms of like me as a human being for example when i was young and i was a trainer you could show me just once a new computer system or a, or a process and i could train people the next day almost like without a script my ability to absorb new information and then translate that into a way that people could learn was almost instant you know a few years later i could see other people could still do that and i was struggling to absorb new information and it took me much more 
preparation to be ready for those kind of moments. So I recognized, hey, probably I'm going to need to specialize more or I'm going to need to evolve my career. And that was a conscious step for me to move away from pure facilitation in like a corporate setting and more into managing people, helping others, training trainers. I thought, yeah, I'll have a longer period of time where I can be successful at that. And I think if I look forward and try to forecast what's coming, I think that's so difficult right now because mm. tech is moving so fast. And we also find it hard to imagine how that's going to impact yeah. different parts of our jobs or our lives. So I just try to lean into, yeah, where do I feel that I add value and let me live there and be mm. conscious of what's coming and how can I use that technology to give me a better platform to reach people um, rather than see it as a threat. But if you ask me that same question in two years time, I may yeah. give you a completely different answer. Who knows, honestly, what the future holds? I was recently at a LinkedIn Talent Connect event where we spoke about AI and when the um, speakers took a Q&A session, everyone was kind of worried mm. that it would take over our jobs. And like, for example, for people who are coordinators and their role is purely booking interviews and, and aligning with managers, et cetera, mm -hmm. that their roles would be obsolete in like two years. Mm -hmm. um, what they were saying is actually, hey, people buy from people always. Um, even if we have very bespoke and intelligent, you know, AI softwares and tools that automate everything. Let AI do all the shitty, boring stuff we don't want to do, mm -hmm. like automate interviews, take notes, etc. And then let us do the good bits. So like, let's actually, we're, we're people, right? We're in the profession. Let's tailor it to our advantage instead, Agreed. instead of making it take over our position. So yeah. that was really interesting to learn. Um, on that note, we met at a event, right? A few right. weeks ago. So um, talking about Connect and Elevate, um, what are you up to at the moment with regards to events and projects? Yeah, good question. I think, you know, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you're always trying to think about like how you can meet more people, you know, get more exposure. It's a kind of thought that keeps you awake at night. Like where, where will actually the next um, client come from? Um, am I, do I know the right people? Will they recommend me? And I've been really trying to think about how I will, you know, in this next year, now that I've been one year as an entrepreneur, how will I be more purposeful in terms of meeting people and, um, and being part of a community? Um, I really don't thrive well in a kind of cold call environment. You know, if I thought that I had to send like a thousand emails a month or reach out to people that I don't know on the phone, that's not authentic for me. And probably that's getting in the way of me driving more business, but I also want to be true to myself. And in my experience, I had got more work or met really interesting people when I was in networking events or community events, shared workspaces, stuff like this, or just making intros with other people, sometimes giving things away for free. So, hey, how about I come and do a workshop for this group of founders, for this um, VC and that I'll show you what I do. I'll give you something for free. And then if you're interested to work with me again, you already kind of saw me a bit in the shop window. You get a feel for what it is that I offer. And if you think that that's a match, then um, give me a, give me a call. So I've really tried to put my product, which is a service out front rather than kind of like any other kind of colder approach, but I still find networking quite hard. I'm a bit too self-conscious sometimes as I go into maybe a room full of strangers industry professionals whatever and you know everybody is there because they want to meet other people and talk and it's with purpose but it still feels a bit awkward to me and i have to really kind of arm myself up kind of give myself a bit of a pep talk to go into those situations and to try and be real like i'm not there just to sell to people i'm there to find out about their business or maybe they're potentially competitors of mine and i want to learn from them or mm. or whatever so in that way, when I go into a networking event, I would much rather be wearing a, a different hat. Like I, I, I've figured out, like I'm a better host than I am mm. um, a, a participant, let's say. So that's actually what I do. I'm normally on stage, asking questions, making people feel comfortable. Yeah. Then I'm in my element. So yeah, actually the the um the networking event that we met at was run by uh, Hannah and Tom yeah and I uh, thought thought they did a great job by the way because what they did is they made it um 
interactive oh they, it was great yeah did you find that yeah yeah the exercises i've never done that in a networking event before it really broke the ice very quickly um because we were in different groups weren't we we were separated and we had to get to know our groups really quickly um which created even more connections because i found you at the bar i remember <laughs> we were both really awkwardly at the bar and i was like i need a wine because i'm straight from work and you've got your work hat on and then you got to put your social hat on mm -hmm. and it's six o'clock at night so i was like yeah. Shit, I need a wine. I need to loosen up. And yeah. that's how I met you. And um, you gave me some great advice that day as well, by the way. Um, but yeah, I found that that event, how they've done it with the different group of people as well. Mm -hmm. It was innovative. It was creative. And I can't wait to get to the next one. Yeah, well, I think actually um, I'm going to partner on the next one. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to getting something out soon. So we really want to create an Amsterdam community of people, people, you know, all different kinds of roles. So... There's been such a positive response from that event, by the way. Like everybody is saying, when is the next one? Can I bring somebody else? So yeah, yeah. so I, actually I'm going to partner with uh, with Hannah and Tom on the next one. Hopefully Are you going to speak? I'm going to speak. I'm going to host. Yay. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to try and be a bit more my authentic self and put myself out there. And, you know, with that desire to make people comfortable. So we try to make it also interactive, safe, and yeah, just trying to build a community of people that, are open with their advice, are vulnerable with each other, are prepared to share their best practice and and feel a sense of togetherness, not just I'm out on my own, um, I don't belong here. You mm. know, there's there's a big community of people and we really want to grow that community. So yeah, I'm really excited to to get started with that. What a great fitting host to have as well because you're so good with public speaking and I, I was just thinking about the role reversal here. You also asked me some questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> You're a bit of a host as well with the with the podcast. But no, really looking forward. Give me some dates. Will I was do. just thinking back to this event and the other ones I've been to. And I think what's unspoken is that people want to participate. Yeah. Even though they're a bit shy, they don't know how to participate in events. They want to have a word in, right? They yeah. want to... Give me a safe entry point, right? Like yeah. Make it okay. Make it easy for me to talk to people I don't know. Yeah, but also be given a mic. Definitely. I'm an expert in my field too. I want to say something about what you're talking about. So right. they also handed the mics, do you remember, at the event and allowed people to talk about specific topics. And I haven't seen that yet. So you're volunteering to speak at the next one. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I'm better like this. No, I'm joking. I do like public speaking, but... Um, I want to see other people doing it as well. So I'm really curious about the next one. Any other projects that you're up to? Are they all top secret? No, it's not top secret, but it is pretty much the stuff that I've been talking about. So I'm really now kind of um, working regularly with different clients on the manager fundamental stuff. So <clears throat> if you're a team that's looking for, you know, growing the skill base of your managers, then for sure, give me a call. Uh, values and culture. So if you're looking now to really define and be honest about who you are and use that, get that calling card out there to hire the right talent and keep the right people in your business, then I'd love to, to talk to you about that. And if you're a founder or an executive or anybody in, in a professional role that would like some one-to-one -one coaching, then I'd be really happy to, to hear from you. You can reach me on um, kicks.net. That's our website. And uh, I'll share my uh, contact details with you. Maybe you can pop them on the screen yeah. or something. LinkedIn as well, right? LinkedIn for sure. Yeah, Chris Shemroth. So yes. your inbox is going to be flooded like 2019, <laughs> 2020 all over again. <laughs> it's going to get flooded. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming all this way and sharing your knowledge. Thank you so much for having me and good luck with the future episodes. Cheers. <laughs>